question is, what is the role of art? I mean, what is it that art does that is a unique contribution to the overall dialogue of our being in the world? The first thing you have to do is separate art from all the myths that are wrapped around it. And the most powerful myth is to mix up the object with the subject. The subject of art is a non-thing. We're talking about feelings. And these feelings have values for us. That is, they enhance, they enrich, they make our lives more interesting. And art really is a continual investigation of our potential as human beings to incorporate those values into our lives. The artist essentially shows you the world in ways you have not seen it before and brings you to look at it again. The beauty of all this is that it's totally free. It's not about owning, it's not about possession. It's about seeing, it's about being aware because it's around you all the time. And what you learn from really spending time with art is an awareness of the world which has the potential to enrich your life at every moment. For me to be an artist was not a very easy thing to do. It was not a graceful thing to do. It was a full, all-out quest. I started essentially alone in a studio, having to sort out the whole issue for myself as to why I was there and what art was about for me. I had to really put my nose to the grindstone. I had to put everything else aside. So it was not a very graceful act. It was a very obsessive kind of act. And a lot of people, I think, still see me as this obsessive person. But it was something I had to do. What I'm building here in this uh, garage in San Diego is a kind of mock-up for a much larger installation than I'm going to do at the Pace Gallery. It's basically made up of three walls that are actually scrim with a blue, red, and yellow light within each wall so that it might become sort of like solid visual planes of color. So um, you've got something which has certain pictorial dimensions to it and at the same time would be spatial. So it might be the bridge away from painting. People have a lot of difficulty, people that are sort of locked into painting have a lot of deal, a lot of trouble dealing with things that are outside of that realm. And although I've been doing that for 20 years, there's still a lot of resistance. So at least that is a possibility. I was a painter in a way. I inherited the role of a painter as an abstract expressionist. Over a period of time, being alone in the studio, the paintings began to talk to me they set up a set of questions which I had to address, I had to pay attention to. And um, one of the things about questions is that as you start to act on them, you're always over your head. You're actually always flying in a way by the seat of your pants. We're going to creak. For example, I could have stopped at the point of being a painter and gone on 
with infinite variations of that. But after a while, when you get involved with what you're doing, and it begins to feed back to you, and you begin to understand the possibilities and the consequences of it, and you become hooked on it. You sort of want to see it through. You want to understand where it's going. Over a long period of time, this inquiry has taken me to places that I had never thought I would be. I think a lot of people are not sure I'm even an artist anymore, that I'm even playing the game anymore. There's like a frame of reference which we use. We decide whether it's art or whether it's not art, whether it's beautiful or not beautiful. And the idea of actually questioning that context really develops a problem for people They forget that we made those rules. We define them as human beings, and we at times as human beings have to redefine them. The thing about growing up in California, you get your first car and you're suddenly floating and moving about in the world in a way which I don't think most people ever have the opportunity to experience that. From the time I was 15, I was on the road, always going somewhere, always doing something. And for a young kid, you fix the car up and make it look just a particular way because it was an extension of your identity. This is like your first aesthetic lesson. I mean, sanding, polishing, changing something, adding something, in a sense, stylize that car. So it's a reflection of who you are. And so the car became a kind of way of being in the world that was footloose and fancy free, and where the world is your oyster. I had a great growing experience. You know, I, I, it was one of the funny things about first entering the art world with this whole thing about meeting everyone who had, had angst and terribly difficult childhoods, and I had no experience of that. I mean, I was just having a good time all the time. This is the Lemert Theater. I used to change that marquee. It was a nice place. Worked here, I'd say, for three or four years. You know, I was assistant manager for a while, because at 17, everybody was off in the Army at that time. So at 17, you could have a job like that. So I'd close it at 1 o'clock, go over there, try and uh, hitchhike a ride, unless I had a girl stashed in the back row, which was uh, uh, the modus operandi when you worked at the movie theaters, you know. <laughs> this is strange to come back here. I haven't been here since the time I left. It's, I really had a good time in this area, you know? I mean, going to high school was, in California at that time, it couldn't have been more fun. I think I sort of just, I didn't pay too much attention to any of the academics. I just sort of floated the whole time I was here. And there were the people who were into hot rods, and there were the people who were into football, and there were the people who were into dancing. And, and I think dancing was the pivotal element to it. It took me a long time to learn how to dance. I could hardly hear the rhythm and the music when I first started. I, I started dancing with the doorknob at home in, in my bedroom. I must have danced there for a year before I could come here and do it. We used to dance at noon in the circle here, and, and it was called the Lindy, and it was all built around one move, which was called the shoulder twist. The girl came at you, and she, as she passed by, she dropped away, and you caught her like this and swung her around. So you developed this sort of counterbalance thing in which the girl came and moved. And so you started, you know, like that. And the whole thing got into a real smooth. So when the moves were made, they were made like so, you know. Bow, bow, bow. <laughs> How in the world did somebody like myself ever become an artist with none of the sophistication that's behind it? Um, my reason in the beginning was very simple. I had this magic wrist and I could draw.
My mother thought the drawings were great. I think probably the flattery essentially made me think, well, that's an interesting thing to do. And then my teachers liked my drawings. But the problem is, after a while, I, when I got into art school, I had this magic wrist. I mean, I was so clever. I mean, it worked so well. It just had a, like a life of its own. It sort of just went on and went on. And I could do these beautiful drawings. And everybody thought, God, look at him. He's terrific. And what happened is I never got challenged. So I thought I was an artist. I acted like an artist. I looked like an artist. I uh, chewed gum like an artist. You know, I had all the right demeanor, as it were. But at a very young age, suddenly I had this show in this quite famous gallery. And um, I had this one of those nice moments that you get once in a great while where you're not shitting yourself when you actually, for just that one moment, actually look at your work. Not all colored by your needs and your desires and your wanting to like it, but actually seeing it cold turkey. And it was terrible. I mean, it was terrible. And that's when I started beginning to be an artist. It was on the basis of that, I looked at it and said, oh my God, what am I doing? You know? It was in the 50s, mid 50s. And I realized there was a young group of artists who were up the street in a place called the Ferris Gallery of Billy Al Bankston and Ed Moses and Kenny Price, a terrific group. And I realized that they knew more than I knew. So I started hanging out with them and they became the seeds of my real education. It was more than a gallery, it was really a, a point of view. And we took seriously everything that went in that gallery. Nothing went in there that we didn't approve or we didn't like. We knew we were onto something. We were absolutely confident, we acted like it. We were a cocky group, I guess, in a way. Abstract expression was really the critical uh, activity going on at that time, and I sort of became a second generation action painter, which was actually a really fun thing to do. I mean, being an action painter was, uh, uh, you, the night before you ate the right foods and you got yourself in the right sense of, a uh, good zen sense, and you would arrive at the studio in the morning, and there would be that big white canvas sitting on the wall, and uh, you would have to sort of prepare yourself, kind of get in, in the right uh, frame of mind to approach it. So you'd maybe clean the studio and clean the palette and get everything sort of all balanced and ready to go. And then finally at one point you'd make a mark on the canvas and then you'd stand and respond to it. It, you, it would move and you would move and it was right and you were right and it was wrong and you were wrong. And there was this sort of kind of continuous sort of running dial. It was a terrific way to be, to be an artist. It was really fun. And you'd do this pr pretty much all day. It would just be this incredible kind of give and take all day long. And at the end of the day you would sort of finish and have a climax and pass out, you know. After a while, I would look back at those paintings, and they really, you know, they were just full of holes. And I began to slowly understand more and more that a painting had its own set of rules, that there was a physics of seeing that was at play in a painting, that, for example, two things could not occupy the same spot at one time. And so a lot of the gestures and colors had volumes, they had weight, and these things, as they structured themselves in the painting, had to make sense within this physics of seeing. Everything in the painting, either works for you or it works against you by the fact that it's simply there. It takes up space, it takes up time, it distracts in a sense. So if it's not really contributing, there's no reason for it. So I began very slowly beginning to sort of take the things out of the painting that were not really necessary. I came to Europe the first time when I was very young, 17. I was in the army, and I was really overwhelmed by the beauty and the richness of it. So I started coming back every time that I had an opportunity. Every time I could get a few bucks together, I'd come to Europe. I always came to Paris, which I thought was so beautiful that it almost brought me to tears at times. You know, a real romantic idol for a young person. I got in this habit of putting a couple of bottles of beer in my pocket and walking all night long. And I began thinking about being an artist and why not live here? But I realized that to do the kind of searching I was doing, this was the last place to be. It already had a culture, it already had its richness. In some ways, Los Angeles was a good place to be. I mean, there's no history, no sense of place. So it's really a good place to challenge ideas to begin at the beginning.
I was asked to do a retrospective, which was going to travel in Europe, uh, Spain, Germany, and here. At each of these, I'll show paintings from the first 15 years or so of my activities. But I'm also going to make new installations that represent my work since the 70s. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The process has entailed at least four visits to each site. Um, go back, begin to kick a few ideas around in my head, then come back again and see whether or not they made any sense in the actual space. Then I went back and began to make a real set of plans. And now the visit for the installation. It took something like 70 steps to get up to and through the exhibition. And so every piece in there, in one way or another, themed off of this thing of steps. A radical piece going up the stairs, which was object-like. And you went up the staircase, and it ceased to be object-like, but began to become environmental. And then you went through a couple of spaces upstairs, which were really installations of the 70s. Then you went through a radial room on the back, which was purely just orange, getting to the point of being almost like a blast furnace. 